I am very excited. And uh, I have to tell you, as I begin the sermon here, that it may be difficult for me to stay on track. <laughs> and I'll tell you, the reason I'm excited is that this particular theme that we're talking about today, of God speaking, is for me one of the primary reasons that I get so excited about God and a connection with God. Did you know that God desires to speak to you? That that is one of the primary ways that God involves in a connection with His relationship with His people is through speaking. And uh, it's exciting for us to know that, that God desires to speak to us. When I was in high school, um, I was given a Bible by my father, and uh, the Bible was designed to be read. Each day you had like three chapters you could read, it had a devotional thought, and uh, I think I was motivated because of the challenge, can you read it in a year, the whole Bible? So I picked it up and I started reading through the chapters. And I remember about a month in, I got a bit agitated. And the reason I got agitated was because in Scripture, what we see from time and time again is the many different ways that we see God speaking to people. We see that God spoke to Adam and Eve. You know, he was walking in the garden. And he says, Adam, did you eat of the fruit I told you not to eat of? And he said, no have this conversation. He spoke to Abraham. He spoke to Moses. Today's uh, opening scripture talked about God speaking to Moses out of a bush. That would be pretty amazing. Right? <laughs> You're walking along and your bush starts talking to you. <laughs> Imagine telling your neighbors, my bush was talking to me today. <laughs> they might call the uh, loony bin for you <laughs> to help you figure that out. But God speaks and I remember being so agitated by this idea that God speaks so many times in Scripture. How is it that I can hear God speaking to me today? Because it seemed to me pretty obvious that when God was about to do something, He first talked to people about it. He spoke about it. And one of the things we discover is that God speaks in the beginning. Do you remember all creation? <laughs> the very first set of verbs that we find in the creation story is God spoke. You know that God said, let there be light. And there was light. God said, let us create mankind in our image. God spoke. God speaking. Now that phrase, let us make man, uh, does not mean that we need to be vegetarian. Let us make man. doesn't mean we have to be vegetarian. But it does mean that God speaks to us and that by creating us in His image, He is giving us the idea that we can actually hear what God is saying, which gives us a deep, profound question. If it is true that it is part of God's nature and that God has been speaking since the beginning of all creation, how it is that we somehow haven't heard what God is saying. We continue to ask the question, what is God's will for my life? How do I hear what God wants for me? How do we actually hear what God is saying to us? And I think that question should somehow irritate us. It should provoke somehow in our spirit the desire to know something of God's voice. To irritate us enough to say, God, what do you have for me? Because I want to hear your voice. Just as I was telling the children this story, you know, say to God, here I am, I am listening. Putting us in that posture of receiving something of that voice of God from creation, if we recognize that God does speak, we have to ask the question, has He continued to be speaking? Did He stop speaking at some point and now we're in a silent period of time? Or is, are we waiting for God to speak sometime in the future? What we have from Scripture is the evidence that God has not stopped speaking, that God continues to speak to His people, and that God desires to have a conversation with us that invites us into a dynamic, personal relationship with God that calls us to daily obedience and faithfulness as His people. I'm excited about that, and I hope you're excited about that. The idea that God actually has something to say to you should excite you. You know, it's like when you get your uh, email blocker and it comes up, boom, you've got mail. <laughs> Guess what? God is saying, I've got mail for you, and I want you to open it up and read it. So today we're going to be looking at the ways that God speaks and how we can figure out a little bit of how God might be speaking to us. And that's really the overall theme of this 
whole theme I've been talking about since January all the way through the middle of February when we start Lent, I'm going to be talking about how do we hear God speaking to us, how do we experience that God who desires us to know Him and for us to know God. So let's look first at the Old Testament, or the Hebrew Scriptures. And I hate calling it the Old Testament because it means that it's somehow no longer relevant. It's old, right? Something that's old, you put it in the back of the closet and never pull it out until you, you have to switch closets or something. You, you stop looking at it. But the Old Testament it isn't that way for us. It's alive and active. God's Word is designed to shape our lives, to transform us, to help us understand something of who God is. And what we see in the scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures, is that through the Bible, God continues to speak to his people in a number of ways. As I was mentioning, God spoke to Adam, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Moses, to Hagar, as she was sitting under a tree, being beaten by the hot sun. God spoke to her through an angel. God used many different variety of ways of speaking, through dreams, through prophecies, through symbolic action. God spoke through a bush. God spoke through a donkey. You know, someone said, if God can use an ass to get through to me, then maybe I'll be able to hear. <laughs> sometimes God has to, you know, hit us over the head by a two-by-four sometimes for us to pay attention that he's got something for us to hear. But God's used so many methods in the scriptures, and I couldn't just continue to list out all the ways that God spoke in the Hebrew scriptures. But one of the things we identify is that God uses a variety of methods for us to hear His voice. And I want us to think about four primary factors that we can kind of coalesce if we were to identify the ways that God speaks in the Old Testament. And one of the things we can identify first is that every time that God does speak, and we identify in Scripture, is that it is unique to that individual. God, when He spoke to uh, Abraham, and He was on His way up to the altar to sacrifice uh, his son Isaac, that was a unique experience. Now the next prophet or the next patriarch did so, you know, well I'm going to have to uh, figure out when I bring that lamb up to the uh, altar. That is, that's when God's going to speak. Or when Moses, this morning's reading, you know, Moses saw the burning bush, he goes, you know what, I remember all the patriarchs before me had a burning bush experience. Maybe I should now have my burning bush experience. We recognize that God chooses, chooses something that is unique in that relationship to help convey His communication to that individual. Now, the reason this is important is that we cannot formulate this sort of uh, equation that if I do this, then God will speak to me and somehow then I will hear it. Now, I know that might be disappointing to some of us. But God does not just always speak through burning bushes. You can't just go into the backyard, light fire your bush, and say, Ooh, God is speaking to me. <laughs> right? That just isn't the way God operates. God doesn't just always speak in that same way. Sometimes they, you know, God speaks through the temple. Sometimes God spoke through the smoke. Sometimes God through, uh, spoke through an angel. Now, that doesn't mean that for each of us we're going to have that exact same experience. But for each one, they were unique. The second part of this, which is an interesting factor, is that the individual they knew that it was God who was speaking to them. They didn't question whether or not maybe they had too much to drink, <laughs> or whether or not they had you know, something undigested that they were still working on. Somehow, in their experience, they knew that it was God who spoke to them. Now, sometimes they questioned whether or not it really was God, and we hear the story of Gideon. You know, an angel of the Lord is speaking to him, and he says, now, are you sure this is from God? And, and so he says, well, what do you need to see for this? And so, so he puts something on a rock, he puts the, the lunch out there as a sacrificial altar to God, and uh, the angel who is speaking to Gideon raises out his staff, touches the rock, and instantly smoke and fire consume the meal over the rock, and Gideon goes, yeah, I think that's from God. <laughs> okay. Maybe God is speaking to me. He needed some sort of confirmation. But he didn't doubt that it was God once he had that confirmation, that it was God who spoke to him. We think about the fleece. You know, there was the time when God spoke to Gideon. And he said, well, are you sure this is what you want? And he says, well, let's, let's do it this way. If the fleece is wet and the ground is dry, then I know that this is what God wants for me. And, you know, he wakes up the next day and it's exactly that way. He goes, but maybe it was just one of those weird, misty mornings. <laughs> so he says, let's do it this way. Let's have the fleece be dry and the ground will be all wet. And that happened. He said, no, I think I'm done testing God. Let's move on. But for each of them, there was in their unique experience the identification that it was indeed God who spoke to them. 
The third factor we recognize is that it was something that they knew, that they knew the message that God had for them. They knew what it was that God said to them. In the message we had this morning, that Moses was in front of the burning bush, and God said, I am about to do something amazing. I'm about to redeem my people. And I am sending you to go. Now, we know the rest of the story is that it's immediately, you know, Moses didn't question whether or not it was God speaking to him. But he started saying, God, I think you got the wrong guy. He, he didn't doubt God. He started to doubt himself. And he started saying, well, God, what if, uh, you know, what if you chose my, my brother, a uh, Aaron? I mean, he's a good speaker. Or, or Mary, Miriam. I mean, she's, she's really wonderful with people. You know, use somebody, anybody, but don't use me. And that's, that's some of what generates. Is once we, we know the message of God, we start to realize that there is a tension within us. And we're going to talk more about that. But there isn't the question of what it is that God speaks. If we look at the scriptures, we identify that not only did they know that God was speaking to them, but they knew what it was that God had asked them to do. And the last one was that the experience of hearing from God was the encounter with God. It wasn't that they had some sort of encounter and they said, hmm, I think God might want to say something. It was in the encounter that they heard God's voice, that it was the speaking of God that was the encounter for them to know God. Now, I come back to this reality in that the, uh, the three main things we get from this is that God always speaks to us in terms of relationship. Because His speaking is an invitation to connect with Him for us to come to know Him in a relationship. Now, He does speak to us and helps us understand His means or His method for us, but because He uses words that communication, it is an invitation for a relationship. Now, could you imagine this, that you never communicate with somebody you love, that you might just you know, show up with, at the doorstep with a gift, and then you run away. <laughs> they come to the door, they, they look at the gift, and they go, huh, well, that's interesting. I wonder who it's from. I wonder what it means. God doesn't do that. When God shows up, He is showing up so that we might know what it is He wants for us, for us to understand, and that is an invitation to come into a relationship with God. When God spoke to Moses and He says, I'm about to do this great thing in Egypt, guess what? It was an invitation for Moses to not only come to know God, but also to participate with God in His activities. And that's really the second main point, is not only is it about relationship, but it is a revelation of what God is about to do. God is doing some activity that He is inviting us to connect with. And as we read through the Word, sometimes you get that experience that, that God is saying, you know, I want you to focus on this aspect of your life. And that is because that is something of what God is doing in your life and in the world around you for you to pay attention to. God is actively at work. And so God revealing himself to Moses wasn't just uh, information. It wasn't just, you know, date line, news, <laughs> something for you to know to log in the back of your head. God is about to do something in Egypt. That's good to know. <laughs> but God is going to say, I'm not just going to invite you in a relationship. I'm going to invite you to participate with me in this activity that I am about to do in the world. It's an exciting reality that when God speaks, it is because it is active. Now we catch this again with beginning with Genesis 1. When God spoke, guess what? It resulted in manifestation. You know, let there be light, and instantly there was light. Could you imagine God spoke and then there wasn't light? Or God spoke and then it didn't happen? That is impossible with God. When God speaks, it results in manifestation. It results in some activity, something that is demonstrated. It's wonderful for us to pay attention to that. Because then when we realize that God is speaking to us, we realize it isn't just good information. But that there's something that is happening that is transforming our lives, that is moving us towards something that is important for us to pay attention to. Sometimes when God speaks to us, first of all, there needs to be a development in our character in order for God's promise to be made fulfilled in our lives. We think of this with the story of Abraham. God spoke to Abraham and said, I need you to leave the land of Ur to go to the land that I am going to show you. And guess what? It was 25 years before Abraham fully felt the, the promise because God said, and I will give you a son who will be the blessing to all nations. And he was waiting for 25 years. 
Now why, why did God wait that long? It's because in that process of leaving the, the foreign gods of his ancestry and moving into trusting God with his life on a daily basis, it was that time of preparation that God was using so that Abraham could be prepared to be the father of the one in whom God would bless so that all nations would be blessed through him. The preparation was very important. And in the same way, when God calls us, often he is calling us to a time of preparing our hearts to be shaped to the character so that we might be more usable for his activity that he is doing in the world. Maybe you, you felt this way. You felt, you know, I really feel that God is calling me to be a little more patient with others. Maybe to be a little more kind. Maybe to be a little more loving. Think of the fruits of the Spirit. You know, when the activity of the Holy Spirit is involved with our lives, it says that the, the result of that, the fruit of the involvement of our lives, is that it bears love, gentleness, patience, peace, kindness, self-control, those goodness, those are all the fruits. And sometimes when God calls us to be a part of His activity, first there needs to be a development of this fruit within our lives so that we can enact that work that He has called us to. You know, He wants us to share with others. And that result, there first needs to be the impact that our lives are shaped in such a way that we recognize that we are participating with God's activity and it's joyful. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. You know, those sort of things come out of the character that He's developing within us. And that is the work of God as He begins to shape our lives that we might be ready for His activity. So this is sort of general as we look at the way that God does speak through the Bible. We realize that He does. And He continues as we look through the Scriptures. The second Scripture we read this morning, John 1, gives us really the, the pinnacle of what this is all about. Because just in the same way that God spoke and it resulted in a reality, it is as if that speaking itself created existence. And it is in the existence, it is in the creation of the, the word that is spoken, that itself has power. The word itself becomes the transforming reality that moves from the impossibility, in from the possible, into existence. Now that action, it's hard to kind of summarize what that is, but that action of speaking is called the Logos, or the Word. Now, in John 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We find that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is where we recognize that Jesus Christ himself is the speaking, active, manifesting result of God's activity. So that when Jesus is with his disciples, he says to Philip, he says, have you not known me? Have I been with you so long that he who sees me sees the Father? This is why it's so important that when we read John 1, we don't recognize Jesus as just you know, some extra deity. <laughs> it wasn't that Jesus was an extra word that emitted from God, but that God's active work of speaking was the result of creating existence. And that Jesus is that transforming activity, very nature and characteristic of God. So Jesus himself is the manifestation of God. In that same connection, he's not a God, he's not an extra God who's out there. But it's critical for us to recognize that if speaking is a core part of God's character, and we see Jesus as the Word of God, that Jesus is himself, by nature, God. The manifestation of God's emission of himself, of his communication, of his desire to connect with us. That should hopefully blow your mind that Jesus himself is that word of God. So that when we recognize that those who come to see Jesus, we see in the Gospels that those who come to see Jesus say, this indeed is God. So many times, you know, that the Jewish persons would come to Jesus and say, Jesus, if you would just show us the Father, or if you would just show us a sign, then we will believe. And Jesus' response was always sort of this, I get this picture of Jesus being grieved even to the depth of his core about that sort of response. Because if they truly knew God, and they recognized that the Word of God is a desire for that relationship, for them to come to know the communication and the love of God, could you imagine you come to somebody who says, I love you, and you say, well, you say you love me, but I really want you to show me that demonstration of your love before I'm going to hear it. 
That'd be pretty brash, wouldn't it? But that's what Jesus was hearing. When the, the Pharisees would come to him and say, we need you to show us some miraculous sign in order for us to recognize that you are the Word of God. Because they missed it. They missed the fact that God the Father himself has now walked amongst them. He is himself the miraculous representation of God. He says, now show us a sign. He says, here I am. <laughs> Here's the sign. You notice there is a uh, wonderful comedian who talks about people, who, you know, whether or not you're foolish, and they need a sign to know whether or not they've done something dumb. <laughs> and he goes, here's your sign. <laughs> well, that's kind of what Jesus was saying. You know, here I am. Here's your sign. I'm the one whom God has given you to see who God is. The very image of God. Colossians goes in to say that everything came into existence through Him and by Him. Nothing came into existence except by Him. He is the very visible demonstration of the image and the glory of God. Wow. And for them to then say, well, just show us a sign, is missing the point. Because Jesus Himself was the communication of God for the people of God. So we've seen now how God has spoken through the Scriptures, through the various persons who have experienced God revealing Himself through the Scriptures. He has shown Himself through Jesus Christ. But that's all past tense, right? Is there anything current going on? Is there any work going on here? Well, this is where we get the work of the Holy Spirit for the church today. Because Jesus says in John 14, when He said, the Holy Spirit will show you all things. He will remind you of all the work that I have been doing amongst you. You won't need anyone to teach you. But John 14, he's saying the Holy Spirit will teach you all these things. Now, one of the things you might underline if you're going to take notes is to say all things. All things. The Holy Spirit is going to reveal to you all things. Now, does that mean that there's something else we need? <laughs> is there some other revelation we're looking for? No. Jesus says, it is good that I will depart from you, my disciples, so that I might send to you the Advocate, who is the one who intercedes for you. He is the one who will reveal to you all things. So you won't need anyone to teach you, because the Holy Spirit himself, who resides within you, will be your instructor. That's pretty cool. Jesus didn't just, you know, he knew that it, when he was on this earth, he was located in one place and one time. But he wanted to communicate so that all people might experience and receive that revelation of God. So he sent the Holy Spirit so that we might all hear Him and experience Him. That's pretty cool. Then in uh, John 16, he says it this way. The Holy Spirit does not speak on His own. But rather, He shares with you, He reveals to you according to God's will what He would have for you. He only reveals, He only speaks what God's intention is for you in that time. Now how do we know what it is that God would have for us? We listen to the Holy Spirit who is Himself speaking on God's behalf to our hearts to know what He has for us right now. And what is it that He can reveal to us? All things. But we recognize as we look at all the things that can be revealed, that it is required for us to rely on the Holy Spirit to help us focus on which of God's truths He needs us to focus on. I mean, the Bible is a pretty big document, isn't it? <laughs> you know, a couple thousand pages if you read through it. How do we know where in the Scripture God wants us to focus? Well, we listen for the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to reveal to us through Scripture which of those truths are a part of God's invitation for relationship, for part of God's current activity, and the ways that God is shaping our character so we might participate with Him in His work around us. For those of you who engaged and, and felt been a part of Bible studies, and, and I really want to continue to encourage the church to do this, because it's only when you get alone with God in reading the Scripture that you start to feel like, you maybe read through the Scripture and you go, you know, this couple of words, I'm not sure why, but these words really stand out to me. That is part of the way that the Holy Spirit is bringing to mind the work of the communication of God for you today. He is opening our mind to His work for us. Now, when we recognize this, we recognize that God is not going to use some miraculous sign, some big sign out there and say, here's your sign. He has already given to us ways for us to understand. So, through prayer, through scripture, 
through our circumstances and through the church, and we're going to be looking at those various ways of understanding as we go into this study together. We're going to be able to understand how is it that the Holy Spirit is speaking to our heart? How do we really discern that God Himself is speaking to us so we can engage in that truth that He would want us to participate in? How can we respond to that invitation of that relationship that God would have for us today? One of the things we recognize, though, is that there are several obstacles to our being able to understand what God would have for us. As we want to hear God's Word, we realize that ourselves need to be ready to receive it. You know, I was just talking with somebody about uh, spending some time in Arizona when I was a youth, and the ground itself, no matter how much rain was poured out, the ground itself didn't receive the water that was poured out for it. And so it would cluster, you know, the flash floods. You'd end up with rivers running down the place, and there'd be huge lakes just instantly formed because the ground itself could not receive what was being given to it. One of the things we need to recognize in our own heart is that unless we are ready to receive, God's Word, no matter how much God is speaking, it's going to be difficult for God to actually penetrate the depth of our heart because not, we're not ready to receive it. We need to be willing to say, yes, Lord, I actually want to hear you speak to me. And I think I, for myself, as I'm looking at this study, I realize there, there's a part of me that says, you know, I don't know if I really want God to speak to me now. I kind of know what I want to do with my life. I kind of know what I'm doing already. And if God were to speak to me, he might interfere with my plans for my life. Is anyone else on that boat? <laughs> Because if we're not ready to receive, or if we're not willing to let God speak to us, it doesn't matter how much we're, we get the formula, we get to understand how it is that God speaks. Because we're not ready when God speaks. The, the reality that God speaks all the time to all persons that we might hear Him is good news. But our hearts have to be ready. I remember being in a prayer session where we're talking about the work of the Holy Spirit for the church and I got this interesting visual image of a hard, dry sponge in a bucket. And I realized that for a lot of us in the church, our hearts are like this hard, dry sponge. That we don't really want to have the water saturating that sponge so that we might receive it. But once we're willing to let God slowly pour out His Word into our hearts, God is more than willing to receive us. More than willing to... Help us understand. It requires the willfulness on our part to receive God. To say, yes, Lord, here I am. A couple of the obstacles that we recognize is that sometimes God has spoken to us. We know that God has spoken to us in the past. We say, yes, I remember in 1972, God said this to me. Hallelujah. <laughs> but, what have we done with it? When God has spoken to us, if we have not been obedient to what God has said already... When we say, well, God, I don't hear you, God's saying, you've got to pay attention to what I've already said. If you're not willing to do what I've asked you to do already, what I'm going to tell you again is to do that. And once you have finally been obedient to what I've called you to, then I might send you a fresh word, but you still haven't paid attention. You've been disobedient to the word I've given you already. Now, you need God to reiterate that word for you? <laughs> to say it again? To open your eyes again to those places that we have been ignoring God's activity in our lives? That's for the Holy Spirit to once again refresh your mind, to open our hearts again to hear that word. But we need to be willing to be obedient. Because disobedience brings about a type of famine in the word of God. <coughs> the nation of Israel, because of their sort of disobedience, God says this in his word, I will remove my spirit from the people. And here's the, the most damning part about the whole thing, is that God said, I removed my spirit from the temple. But they didn't even notice. As a church, and this is why I get so excited about this, God so desires for us to know him. He desires to speak to us for us to receive that word, for him to pour out his Holy Spirit on his church, for us to receive his word, and for that everything that we do as a church, to know that it is guided by the active work of God, who invites us into a relationship with him, to know of his current activity, that we might be shaped according to his purpose. Lord God, thank you. 
that you do speak to your people. And that we can anticipate that indeed, as we look to God, He will speak to us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for Your Word. And we thank You that You continue to pour out Your love on us. God, we ask now, as Your church, that You would help us to remove those areas of obstacle in our lives that have been really keeping us from You. Even as it has been intentional, Lord, help us to be yielding enough that we would be willing to hear your voice again. That you would indeed be the Lord of our church, that you would be the Lord of our lives, that you would take control of our, our understanding of what you're saying to us. And that you would confirm to us in those unique and personal ways that you do love us. That you're calling us according to your purpose that we might participate you with you. Lord, we thank you for all of this through Jesus Christ, your word for us. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing, open our eyes, hymn 454.